Well, welcome uh, to this uh, mighty colloquium with our guest and friend, uh, Tony Hayward, the uh, CEO uh, of uh, BP. Uh, Tony is a geologist by training with a PhD from the uh, University of Edinburgh, and he joined uh, BP uh, as a rig geologist. Uh, we understand, uh, he confessed today to our fellows, uh, in his only his third attempt to be hired by BP. Uh, he finally got, got over the threshold, uh, and uh, with a few intermediate stops, um, uh, director of BP Exploration uh, about uh, 12, 12 years ago, treasurer in 2000, uh, becoming group chief executive uh, in May of 2007. Uh, Tony, I think it's fair to say, without getting into great details, uh, faced significant number of challenges uh, at that time of, uh, of transition um, uh, and uh, is these days getting quite good press, I might say, uh, in terms of uh, having uh, the company uh, operating well, uh, producing, uh, and maintaining, I think, a, its, uh, its stance taken quite early uh, in terms of recognizing the need uh, and acting on the need to address uh, climate risk mitigation, uh, for example, with its diversified portfolio. We are very pleased to have BP here as a uh, member of the Energy Initiative. In fact, uh, the founding, founding member uh, of uh, the MIT Energy Initiative. And in fact, as uh, President Hockfield said just a few minutes ago to Tony, that, that confidence uh, shown uh, in where we were going here at MIT in terms of our focus on energy environment was very, very important, and we, we really appreciate that early support uh, and the continuing relationship. In fact, many of you may know that besides the Energy Initiative, BP uh, has a uh, major presence in terms of a projects academy and operations academy with the Sloan School of Engineering. And in fact, I just heard uh, again in, in the discussion a few minutes ago that 300 of BP's 500 senior executives have one way or another uh, interacted with uh, with, with MIT, so it's really quite uh, a substantial uh, relationship. Um, Tony is also a member of our uh, uh, external advisory board uh, for, the, for the Energy Initiative, uh, and we val certainly value his advice uh, there. Uh, at a more personal level, um, Tony is also a rabid athlete, uh, still doing triathlons uh, several times a year. Uh, as, a, uh, uh, as CEO of BP, although he admits that he cancels out of half of them, but uh, still, still manages uh, uh, two, uh, two or three. Uh, also a uh, very competitive uh, sailor, uh, and uh, uh, it's funny, some of the executives who have left BP seem to have been sailors as well, but I don't know if there's any connection, connection to that. Uh, Tony Hayward is a great, great friend of, 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 of MIT, as I said. Uh, and certainly has a very, very broad, obviously a broad perspective on the whole energy environment challenge. And today he will talk to us uh, on facing the harsh realities, shaping the en energy mix of the future, and importantly, starting today. Tony. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, it's great to be here, and thank you for the invitation. And Thank you, Ernie, for those uh, kind words. Uh, I, I do recognize that I'm one at one of the great learning centers uh, of, the, of the world. And I also, of course, I'm, I'm fully aware that uh, the last speaker on energy at MIT was the President of the United States. So <laughs> I, I don't feel under any pressure at all to, <laughs> to perform here. Uh, I'm also aware that the Brits have not always had the greatest record when it comes to offering ideas on technology to America. Some of you may or may not know the history, but uh, 120 years ago, the engineer chief of the British Post Office, a one William Priest, said that telephones were fine for Americans, but the Brits didn't need them because they had errand boys to carry the messages. <laughs> it was about the same time that the president of the British Royal Society, one Lord Calvin, declared that radio had no future, x-rays were a hoax, and heavier-than-air flight machines were impossible. His actual words were, I have not the slightest molecule of faith in aerial navigation other than ballooning. <laughs> so I hope I can do a little better than uh, all of that today. Um, it, it is great to be here. 
we do attach great value to the relationship between BP and MIT. Uh, and I thought I should start by thanking uh, the president uh, of MIT, Susan Hockfield, for the leadership she's shown in creating the Energy Initiative. Uh, and I want to th thank Ernie again for, and his team for everything that they've done to establish the Energy Initiative so rapidly. In a, in a very short two years, the Energy Initiative has begun, been recognized worldwide as a leader in both advances, advances and ideas. So it's a great thing that, that's been achieved here. Uh, and certainly from my perspective, this is a project whose time has come. Why do I say that? It is because we need to bring the best brains from a range of disciplines to bear on the complex issues of energy and the environment. And we need to do it in a logical, methodical, and realistic way. That's what should happen at the international level. It, it isn't what's happening today, but it's what should happen. But it is what is happening here at MIT. You're doing a great job in providing a role model for the world. Let me begin by explaining the challenges involved in energy. Uh, from my perspective, there are three distinct strands. The first is how to meet the world's growing demand for energy. In particular, how to satisfy the aspiration of people in emerging economies to achieve the living standards that we all regard as commonplace in the mature economies of the West. The second is how to meet that demand in a way that is environmentally sustainable. And the third is how to provide energy reliably in a world where there is a mismatch between where energy is produced and where it's consumed. And supplies are increasingly concentrated in just a few key regions. So the three challenges are access for all, sustainability, and security. And our future energy needs all three. Uh, and this is, of course, the type of complex problem that world-class researchers thrive on. Many complex questions have been posed here at MIT over the years, and you've come up with innovative solutions in a whole range of areas from computer memory to artificial limbs. But such advances only come if the people involved adopt the right approach. Part of that approach is to be completely realistic about the givens that you start with and the tools you can use. If you're realistic about what you can, what can and can't be done, then the possibilities start to emerge. The energy challenge is just like that. We have to accept the harsh realities of the situation in order to identify workable solutions. And those realities cover three areas. The facts of energy demand and supply, the opportunities that are provided by technology, and the rules that are created by policy makers. And I'm going to look at each of those in turn and then draw some general conclusions. The starting point for any analysis of energy has to be the scale of demand. For the next several decades, we're looking at strong rising demand driven by the extraordinary economic transformation of China, India, and other developing countries. And I thought I'd illustrate this with a personal story. About 25 years ago, I was a young geologist in Beijing, and I had a driver. He was a young guy. I wasn't allowed to drive because the country was only just opening up at that stage. And he lived with his wife and young son and parents in a two-roomed house. Those of you who've been to Beijing in a hutong. And his energy consumption at that time was two kerosene lamps and a coal fire brazier for both cooking and heating. And last summer, I took my family back to Beijing for the Olympics. And we had a great time at the Olympics, spent two weeks there. And the same man who'd driven me around 25 years ago is still working for BP as a driver. This is an important point. He's still doing the same job. And at the end of the trip, he said, come and see my new apartment. So I thought, oh, this will be interesting. So we drive out into the suburbs of Beijing and we arrive at a 25-story tower block with underground parking. His Chinese-built car is in the underground car park. We get off at the 18th floor, and his wife's electric scooter is parked on, in the hallway. And we go into his apartment, and it's a very nice three-bedroom apartment with underfloor heating, 
it's cold in the winter in Beijing, uh, air conditioning and humidifying for the summer. In the kitchen, there's this enormous American-style fridge-freezer thing, much bigger than we've got at our place in the UK. There's a small flat-screen TV on the wall of the kitchen. There's an enormous flat-screen TV in the wall of the lounge, which prompted me to go out and buy a bigger one. <laughs> and there's a flat-screen TV on each one of the walls of the bedroom. Uh, and, uh, you know, th that's an extraordinary story. Uh, and it's been repeated 350 million times in China over the last 25 years. An extraordinary story of wealth and prosperity coming through extraordinary period of economic growth. Uh, and, uh, of course, you know, you think about his energy consumption, two kerosene lamps and a coal brazier to all of that. Uh, and the good news is that 350 million people have achieved that, and that's a great thing. And the more challenging thing is there's another 800 million people in China yet to go through that transition. And by most people's estimates, 600 million of them will do it. And there's probably half a billion in India and perhaps a billion others around the world. So you know, the, the, that little story illustrates, I think, quite well the challenge that the world faces. The demand for global energy is projected to rise by 45% between today and 2030. That's roughly equivalent to adding two more United States to the global consumption. And meeting that demand requires an extraordinary level of investment. The energy industry is investing around a trillion dollars a year, and between now and 2030, it's estimated that we need to invest between 25 and 30 trillion dollars to satisfy that demand. If you look at oil supply, uh, in oil supply alone, the current production is around 85 million barrels a day. We'll need to increase it to around 100 million barrels a day by 2030. It doesn't sound like very much, but because of the natural decline in oil fields, we actually need to add 50 million barrels a day of new production capacity by 2030. That is the same as four Saudi Arabias. So some of you are probably sitting there saying, well, why do we have to, why is so much of the growth needs to come from fossil fuels? And I think this is one of the first harsh realities we have to face up to. These projections that I'm talking about assume that the current policies to promote emission reductions are not only continued but significantly tightened. And yet we still see up to 80% of energy demand in 2030 coming from fossil fuels. Uh, and that is because of the sheer scale of the world's energy industry and the very slow turnover of the capital stock, such as power stations and the long lead time required to build assets such as nuclear facilities or even renewable power at scale. If you look at the IEA projections, even their most radical scenario for emission reductions still envisage two-thirds of energy coming from fossil fuels in 2030. Renewable energy is clearly an essential part of the future energy mix, and BP supports that aim as a company with major investments in wind, solar, and biofuels. We're investing about a billion dollars a year into alternative energy, and we have been for the last four or five years. But the harsh reality is that as of today, all of the world's wind, solar, wave, tide, and geothermal energy accounts for only 1% of total consumption. And looking ahead on the most radical scenario that the IEA have created, those forms of energy will only meet 5% of total demand by 2030. So those are some of the parameters within which we need to operate. We can't pretend that fossil fuels can be switched off, like analog TV was in the US this summer, or that renewable energy will suddenly snowball like the internet did a decade ago. There are real limitations of physical capacity, engineering, and economics which have to be faced. And that takes me to the second set of realities, the tools and technologies which we have at our disposal. As I've said, the answer cannot be the wholesale replacement of hydrocarbons with renewables. 
but neither can it be nuclear alone, carbon capture alone, biofuels alone, or electric cars alone. All of these technologies are from time to time promoted in a way that suggests that they are the future. But the fact is that there is no one miracle solution. The future of energy will not come from a quick fix, but from a broad mix. It will contain a range of energy types for fuel, power and heat. At the moment, the spotlight tends to lurch from one new technology to another, uh, and we risk overlooking some of the basic, more common sense solutions. First, in almost any analysis of greenhouse gas mitigation, the greatest source of emission cuts is energy efficiency. It's obviously the least glamorous answer, but the down-to-earth solutions are quite frequently the best ones. The McKinsey Global Institute suggests that energy use could be cut by one-fifth by 2020 and 8 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases avoided through energy efficiency. Uh, and the interesting thing is that those investments would more than pay for themselves. This is borne out by BP's own analysis. In transport, for example, increasing the efficiency of the internal combustion engine can remove some 25% of CO2 emissions. Using full hybrid cars can remove a further 25%. So, so there is the beginning of a potential roadmap, and it's good to see the US administration travelling along the first stage of the road with measures to improve fuel efficiency. We need to look at each type of vehicle and fuel on a well-to-wheels basis because emissions occur at different stages of the life cycle. Biofuels create tailpipe emissions but avoid them upstream because their feedstocks absorb carbon. Electric cars avoid tailpipe emissions but create them upstream because they depend on power stations. Electric vehicles have promise, but they'll only reduce the carbon footprint of transport significantly if the source of, of power itself is decarbonised. Biofuels represent another instance where public debate is in danger of becoming derailed. There's naturally a concern over the sustainability of biofuels. Do they compete with food? Are they produced in ways that damage ecosystems? Uh, and the answer is... It depends on the biofuel. There's a vast range of biofuels, some good, some bad. In BP, we're investing in biofuels that provide high energy and real environmental in benefits without damaging either nutrition or diversity. These are Brazilian ethanol made from sugarcane, the most efficient biofuel available today. Biobutanol, which is more, a more advanced molecule than ethanol, and lignocellulosic fuels, such as ethanol from energy grasses. Ethanol from energy grasses is potentially a very good answer to the challenges of access, sustainability, and security. It offers high energy yields. It does not compete with food. It provides a literally homegrown substitute for imported oil. And it has the potential not simply to cut emissions, but to be a net absorber of carbon. Search a strategic fuel, or potentially strategic fuel, should not be lumped together with the much less beneficial ones. We believe that biofuels will become very significant businesses in the coming years, and they could easily make up 10% of the global transport fuel by 2030, and potentially as much as 20% of the US gasoline pool. But, of course, transport is only one part of the picture. Whereas transport has millions of small moving units with lives of a decade or two, power involves relatively a few large static assets with lifetimes of 40 or 50 years. It's interesting to note that the average coal-fired power station in the US was built in 1964. Under President Johnson, when the Beatles topped the charts, and none of us had heard of the PC, the internet, or mobile phones. And coal remains by far the biggest source of American electricity. 
Yet the harsh reality is that coal is the most carbon intensive form of energy in widespread use. Coal generates 50% of America's power, but 80% of the resulting CO2 emissions. If we're to have any chance of transitioning to a lower carbon world, coal will either have to be cleaned up or phased out. So what are the alternatives? Renewables will play an important role. Wind power, for example, can be cost competitive in certain locations. In the US, it's been the fastest growing of all energy sources over the last couple of years. But the technology, infrastructure and regulatory framework for such alternative energies are expected to take decades to be deployed at scale. Nuclear power supplies about 5% of global energy and it will take at least 10 years for its share to start rising. Even then, I think it's debatable about how far it will go, given issues around permitting, cost and security. Coal plants can be fitted with carbon capture and storage, but the operative word is can. There's still no commercial scale power plant with CCS in the world, and its deployment is mainly limited to upstream energy projects. BP operates one of the world's largest existing CCS projects in Algeria, and we're developing a CCS gas fire plant in Abu Dhabi and a major coal fire project in California. But the challenges of CCS are such that I don't believe we'll see it used at commercial scale for at least another decade or more. And if and when it's established, it will give rise to very significant costs. There is, of course, another option. The cleanest burning fossil fuel and a source of energy that's plentiful in the US, uh, and that is natural gas. Combined cycle turbines powered by natural gas are quick and relatively inexpensive to build and can generate power at 60% efficiency. They emit less than half the greenhouse gases of a con conventional coal plant per unit of power generated. Gas plants can be quickly switched on and off and are therefore act as ideal flexible backup for renewables such as wind and solar, which by their very nature are intermittent. But is there enough gas available? Well, the answer is absolutely yes. America has seen a quiet revolution in its gas fields in the last few years as new technologies have been introduced. They include hydraulic fracturing, horizontal drilling, multiple completions to extract gas from complex formations. US gas production increased 7.5% last year, a major step up compared with previous years. And by our estimates, the US is now sitting on between 50 and 100 years of gas resources at current rates of consumption. Globally, the world is estimated to have around 60 years of gas, but new technologies could add many decades to that number. In 2008, gas was the only fossil fuel which saw its consumption increase in both the OECD and non-OECD countries. If we could ramp up natural gas use, we could retire the oldest and dirtiest coal plants. In fact, BP has calculated that for a fraction of the cost of other options, as much as 30% of the waxman markey reduction target could be rapidly achieved through expanded use of natural gas. And that takes me to the final set of realities I want to mention, and those are ones that relate to policy. Uh, and clearly you had the chief policy maker with you just a week ago. So here's what I would have said to him if I had been here. I think it's clear the transition to a lower carbon world will not take place without significant government intervention. It's clear that the free market cannot solve this problem on its own. By far the most powerful policy intervention on energy would be establishing a price for carbon. For the market to meet the world's growing demand for energy in a sustainable way, Governments need to set a stable and enduring framework, starting with a uniform price for carbon. A price that treats all carbon as equal, whether it comes out of a smokestack or a tailpipe. 
Carbon pricing will make energy conservation more attractive and alternative energy more cost competitive. It will allow informed investment in fossil fuels and will encourage investment in the technology necessary to reduce the carbon they produce. This is already starting to happen in Europe where we have the EU emission trading system and I believe it will happen in due course in the US. But of course we work in a global industry. Ideally we should be working towards establishing a global price. Uh, and I think one of the critical tests for the talks in Copenhagen in December is to what extent we've made progress towards establishing a mechanism that will set a global price for carbon. Once we can agree on a clear goal, then we need to face a further reality, which is that a carbon price alone will not be enough to reach the goal. Politically, the carbon price could never be set high enough to change some aspects of consumer behaviour. The reality is that to make the kind of difference we're talking about, carbon pricing will need to be supported by both economic incentives and by regulation. Recent experience in the US shows where regulation can help. Fuel standards have helped improve energy efficiency in vehicles. I saw an SUV advert last night for an SUV that will go 35 miles per gallon, which is unheard of 10 years ago. Uh, and that's a consequence of the federal cafe requirements and the technology breakthroughs that have accompanied those on the part of the auto manufacturers. America's transport fleet is much more fuel efficient than it used to be and the Obama administration is going further by demanding even tougher cafe standards. Similar policies can and are being applied to energy efficiency in buildings and here too a combination of government regulation and incentives is in my view the way to go. You're probably wondering why a businessman is standing here advocating greater government intervention. I don't think that's a contradiction at all. The father of modern capitalism, Adam Smith, taught that markets work best when they're properly regulated by governments. And the scale and complexity of this particular challenge is different from the usual workings of a market economy. To mitigate climate change and secure reliable energy supplies, we need governments to create a roadmap to set the framework within which the markets can deliver. I'd like to make one further point, if I can. These are not issues in which we have endless time to deliberate. It does matter what we do over the next 25 years. There's a real benefit to deciding on the most cost-effective remedies now, such as promoting energy efficiency, using gas in power, and biofuels in transport. These options make economic sense today and will not cost the world more than it can afford. As I indicated when I began, this is a complex problem and the solution will have many elements. An international agreement, national policies, mechanisms for transfer of technology and funds, a carbon price, new regulations, a mix of technologies, changes in behaviour and ongoing research into new possibilities. It requires a coordinated, integrated, multidisciplinary approach, both in the deployment of solutions available now, like natural gas and energy efficiency, and in the development of solutions for tomorrow. The MIT Energy Initiative is playing a dual role, first at the macro level in studying the science and politics, and second at the micro level in researching specific technologies from gasification to biofuels. I, I want to end by drawing a few conclusions based both on the work you're doing and the observations that I've made. Number one, we need to be absolutely honest with ourselves about the harsh realities of energy. We must not put our faith in unrealistic solutions and overlook real possibilities for progress. Number two, the overall problem may be complex, but there are some simple things that can be done right now to help solve it. Exploiting natural gas and promoting energy efficiency are two that stand out it's quite clear we've yet to pick all of the low-hanging fruit. 
Number three, looking at innovation for the future, the really interesting things happen at the borders where different disciplines meet, as you are showing. In particular, there's real scope to apply some of the enabling technologies that have made such dramatic progress over the past decade, such as nanotechnology, superconducting, and IT, to the energy challenge. Biotechnology is another. At BP, we're supporting the Energy Bioscience Institute at Berkeley in Illinois. This not only provides the chance to develop advances in biofuels, but also to explore how biotech might open up new possibilities from exploration to carbon sequestration. My fourth and final point is that all of this depends on people. I will wait a long time for an oil rig or a wind turbine to walk into my office with a bright idea. Human capabilities are needed to create the technological, commercial and political solutions to the energy challenge. That is why we need to invest in people and to focus on investing in the most important skills. Our industry and its people are central to the way that civilization develops. This is not a sunset industry. It's one of the world's great growth industries. One that has to provide continued access to energy at the same time as sustainable energy and secure energy. That's a big challenge, as I've tried to illustrate, and we need great people to meet it. So I'd like to end with a message to some of the students here, which is ask you to take a good look at the energy sector as a career. I can't think of a better place in which an individual has more of a chance to make a real difference and a real contribution, as well, of course, as, ha as having a great time. Energy does represent one of the greatest challenges of the 21st century, but with the best people on our side, I'm absolutely convinced we can meet it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Hello, Mr. Hayward. Thank you very much for visiting with us today. I appreciate it. Um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about Salt and Hull and um, the biofuels work that's been or is being done there. Um, I know you're working very closely with DuPont and um, uh, some biological uh, processes uh, for the production of butanol, first the production of ethanol and the production of butanol. I know that you want to uh, produce butanol at a price uh, equivalent to what we can currently produce ethanol at. I'm wondering if we're there or if we're not there, and um, also wondering when we'll see uh, butanol introduced into uh, to the UK, and then when we'll see it here in the United States. Okay, um, just just for those of you who, who aren't as familiar as uh, my friend here is with the subject, we we're doing um, a couple of things in the biofuel space. One is to seek a better molecule than ethanol because. Uh, ethanol is not by any means a very good molecule. It uh, doesn't have much energy density, so its, uh, its efficiency relative to gasoline is about 70%, and it attracts water, so it's a problem to deal with, um, with their existing facilities. So the task is, can we create something uh, butanol or, or beyond? Uh, and uh, we, as you say, we've had a research, it's actually a development project running now for three years, uh, and we're just about to go to commercialization. Uh, and so far, so good. Um, the, the key issue is the enzyme technology and how to go to scale. Uh, and uh, we will, we, we, we're in the process of beginning to build a pilot plant to test the scalability. Uh, I think this will get cracked within the next two or three years. Uh, and we will see a commercial butanol being produced from conventional ethanol feedstock. We're using wheat as it happens at Hull, but you know you could use anything that you can today use um, to produce ethanol. So I think you know I think it's going to happen, and it's going to happen you know within three to five years. Uh, and it looks like the cost will be um, certainly competitive with where the oil price is today. Uh, I would expect it to fall to you know perhaps. 60 or 70 dollars a barrel, which is 
a bit more expensive than ethanol, but not significantly so. No, you won't. <laughs> this is this is well, this is well, be, well beyond me now, Ernie. <laughs> Twenty-five years ago, I may have had some chance. I think. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Um, I'm an undergraduate here. Uh, I'm a senior in electrical engineering. About the natural gas, um, for it to be competitive with coal, I had a, I had an internship in New Orleans this summer, and I saw the shelf dying. And for deep water projects, for example, you need more investment, initial investment. You need more capital. So what kind of domestically, what kind of natural gas resources are you targeting in the United States mm. and internationally? Mm. And what kind of incentives do you need for, to you know, make that investment? Yeah. Well, the good news is we don't need any incentives. We, we, we need a level playing field for carbon, uh, which is not what's occurred so far. But the revolution that I talked about it, it is one that's occurred in the old mature gas fields of um, the United States uh, and it's to do with something called shale gas which people have known about for a very long time but we didn't think that we could develop it commercially uh, and over the last really over the last three or four years uh, there have been some real breakthroughs in drilling technology uh, fracking technology which is basically just pumping water at a high pressure down a well to fracture the rock and then the completion technology which is what you put down the well uh, to line the well bore, that has allowed us to now commercialise very large quantities of shale gas. Uh, and it's completely transformed the natural gas landscape in the United States. Uh, and it's, it's very plausible to believe that there are, you know, maybe 100 years worth of supply that can come on stream at prices of around $6, maybe less, per MCF. So uh, I think... The, the US, the world, has not quite woken up to this possibility yet, uh, and it doesn't need any incentive to make it happen. It just needs a fair price on carbon. Uh, and if it, we had a fair price on carbon, then we would see that it would be very competitive vis-a-vis uh, -vis coal. Um, well, I think, I, you know, this comes, I, I think we, we, can, we, can, we can manage this in a way that has a very modest or, or no environmental footprint. The issue is, of course, the use of water. And uh, in some areas, we will have to understand the impact on water, where water is an issue. I mean, I, I would say that uh, is a forthcoming attraction for all of us, the issue of water and its it's undoubtedly a forthcoming attraction for the energy industry. We, we'll sort of figure out what to do on the CO2 front, uh, and then we'll be trying to figure out what we do with water because they come very much together. But, but I, I think it's an entirely tractable problem in most areas of the US where a shale gas is likely to be exploited. Uh, thank you for coming to give us this very interesting talk. Um, I wanted to challenge your characterization of the growth of renewables in the next 10 years from 1% to 5% as being a radical projection. I know, I know it's not the term that you originated, but that you quoted. I think that 10 years ago, if people had projected that 48% of every, every adult on the planet would have a cell phone in 2009, what that would have been characterized as a very radical projection. And a calculation I did before this talk, after I read the summary of it this morning, was that if the production of photovoltaic panels in the next 10 years grows at the rate that the production of cell phones grew in the last 10 years, they would provide 20% of all the world's energy needs 10 years from now. It may be radical, but I think history can be our teacher about what is possible to do. I agree with you that the main limitation, or I believe of the three limitations that you expressed, policy is going to be the limiting factor. But I think there is some evidence that much more aggressive transformation scenarios are technically possible. Well, uh, you know, I, th I, I accept your challenge. I think I stand in a place that it is the scale of the energy industry 
that uh, is continually underestimated by those who don't live in it every day of the week. And uh, there has been dramatic breakthroughs uh, on solar, and it's still a very, very small part of the overall energy mix. It's less than 1% today. Uh, and it is because one of the things about renewables is that it's actually a very, distribu very distributed source of energy. The energy density is very low versus the conventional energies that we're trying to replace, which have a very high energy density. So there is an enormous sort of, you know, to get the same energy as you get from a well that produces 10,000 barrels of oil, you need 100,000 acres of biofuels. Uh, and the same applies to solar. It's not a very efficient way of creating energy. Uh, and that, you know, that remains a challenge. Which one of which is going off? That's <laughs> 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 why we were bleeping, Ernie. Sorry. Uh, the cell phones, of course, uh, one was introducing them. Uh, they completely refunction the capability. You opened up like one of the automatic things. They could be mobile, even if they or didn't have limitations in infrastructure and everything for the first time. With solar, as important as it is, it's not actually producing a new function in a certain sense. So, Thank you very much. I have a question about policy. And I'm interested specifically in um, how you see sort of, uh, so you said that you need both a cap and trade system as well as potentially mandates and standards um, to control greenhouse gas emissions and send appropriate signals to industry. How do you see the balance between these two types of instruments and particularly uh, under what circumstances or what rules of thumb would you use to say uh, cap and trade system or carbon pricing would work more effectively versus choosing mm -hmm. a more um, mandates and standards type of approach? I think energy efficiency can, can only be tackled through mandates. I don't think uh, carbon pricing alone will achieve anything like the opportunity that is available in the world of energy efficiency, because we won't, we won't couldn't possibly set a carbon price high enough to cause all of us to change our behaviours. You know, you're not going to go out, if, you, if your cost of electricity goes up by two cents a kilowatt hour, you're not going to go and rebuild your house or go and launch a major new insulation programme. If the price of gasoline goes up by five cents a gallon or ten cents a gallon, that's not enough to change behaviour. We know that. So you have to do. You have to change behaviour in terms of efficiency through regulation. And I think that's the that's the major area for for, for regulation to make an impact is in the world of efficiency. No, I, you know, I mean, if we're going to solve, I'm, I'm, look, I'm in, I'm in the spirit of solving the problem. The problem is, you know, we need to, and we won't get more efficient unless we regulate efficiency. And we sort of demonstrated that the world over, actually. Uh, hi, I have, I have a question about biofuels, but you can expand the answer more broadly about new technologies and how they ever make it to 1.1 percent of the market, let alone 1020. Um, I was a graduate student here 20 years ago in biotechnology, and I worked on cellulosic ethanol. Everybody in that field left the field when the price of oil went down, and when we realized that nobody was willing to transfer the technology to any large scale because the margins in the end product simply weren't there. The pharmaceutical industry ended up being the industry that could afford to pay for the technology development and the transfer because at the end of the day, the product was so valuable that with minimum capital investment, you could actually produce it and that worked. 25 years later, I'm now back for the last five years looking at the space again and working in the space and I have the same concern. And that is, I think all these innovations that are going on in small companies fundamentally have no way to see the light of day because companies such as yours and many others who are investing in BP are going to invest in technologies that are really minimally kind of a little bit more risky than what they can do today, but they're not going to take dramatic risk. That dramatic risk usually happens in startups. But those startups have no access to capital and won't given a volatile oil price. Forget about a high oil price because 
anybody, we saw what happened the last two years, right? So venture capitalists moved into the area. I'm a venture capitalist now. They moved into the area, and the price of oil went down. They all ran for the, for the doors. And any sane person today would expect the same thing to happen a year or two from now again. So given price volatility, given huge capital and necessity, and given low margins, how do you expect innovation in startups? How is it that they end up getting rewarded for the risk they take? So I guess what I'll ask you is, as a CEO of a major company, put your hat on for a startup CEO and think about how you would make a pitch to a BP or anybody else that can get rewarded for the risk they would take to innovate. Yeah. <laughs> <coughs> well, of course, you're, you're right. And, you know, but, and the first thing I would say is that if your technology re relies on oil prices above $100 a barrel, you're probably pursuing the wrong technology. You know, it, it, we're not, we won't solve this problem by creating high-cost solutions. We have to solve it by finding low-cost solutions, solutions that are competitive with the price that we pay for energy today. You know, the world's not in a, pl in a place that says it will double, it is prepared to pay twice the cost for energy. So, um, uh, you know, we, we actually do quite a lot with small startups, actually. We have um, a, a bunch of uh, uh, joint ventures across the biofuel space, I'm sure you're well aware, actually. Uh, and... Uh, we think it's an important part of, uh, because we don't think we're going to invent, uh, invent all the new technology either. So we think it's an important part of understanding and, and seeking opportunities, for example, in biofuels. Uh, you know, different companies take a different approach. Our view is that as a consequence of the circumstance the world faces today and the policies that are being enacted by the policymakers, biofuels will be a very important part of our business over the next 10 to 20 years. And on that basis, we are participating quite aggressively, actually. Some other companies have taken a different view, but BP has taken a view that this is going to be an important part of our business. In part, it's going to cannibalize our business. It's a bit, I, I always think of it a bit being a bit like laptops and mainframes. Uh, but if anyone's going to do biofuels, it should be the big integrated oil companies because we have the infrastructure with which to manage and distribute the product. But, but I guess, you know, back to your question, um, you have to have something that, you know, looks like it might work at a price that makes sense. And if it relies on 100 bucks, then it's not going to fly. Hey, uh, Mr. Hayward, um, kind of on the same line on the uh, venture capitalism and, you know, the application of renewable energy and energy in uh, overall, is that I want to know your personal take on, you know, um, the, the new business model that we are seeing now on Better Place, um, the Shai Agassi, what he's doing now, and because we know the one huge problem that facing the application of renewable energy or whatever energy is the scale. And I think Better Place is really addressing such issue. And I want to know your personal uh, comment on that, uh, on such business model. And I want to know uh, how far that BP is going to support such business model, because this potentially going to you know, um, destroy all the demands for oil, potentially. Um, well, I think you're, the point that you've made that Yeah, so better, you want to explain, I'll explain, better, I, well, I'll make sure I'm, I may not get this right, but better place, I think, is the electric cars and transfer batteries, is it? Battery swap. Yeah, with battery swapping. So the idea is that um, you have um, stations that stock batteries and you have electric powered cars and you, when you, your battery runs out, you sort of drive up and swap the battery. Um, I think today uh, the battery technology is not in a place where it's, uh, it's, it is something that we should be looking to deploy big time. Uh, I think it has a role, and it probably has a role in public utility fleets that go every night back to the same location. 
So you can imagine, you know, a fleet of buses, every night they return to the same location to be charged. You know, the reality is that today's technology, you can sort of do 40 miles before you need to recharge your battery. And the battery recharging takes three to five hours. Most of you probably know that. So I, I don't think that we're going to see battery technology making a big impact, actually, in the next 10 to 20 years. Way out, we may well do. But, of course, in terms of solving the issue we're trying to deal with, which is one of uh, climate change and greenhouse gases, unless you've decarbonized the power source, you're no further ahead. So, you know, if you're going to go that route, you better be damn certain that the power source that's providing the battery power is coming from something that doesn't have CO2 emissions attached to it. Otherwise, you've probably gone backwards. Uh, yeah, you sure. Um, yeah, uh, sorry, like just two points. The first point is that this, um, exactly the, uh, I mean, the business model for Better Place is that they saw that, you know, the battery technology is not ready yet now. That's why they're addressing the scale. They basically put all the recharge stations, it's like a million recharge stations everywhere in the city so that you will never run out of place to recharge your car. And the swap, battery swap, thing is for long distance. So, um, and then the second point is that, you know, the um, energy coming from you know, energy source, they're actually building, you know, massive uh, solar panels in Israel and, you know, basically just getting all the energy from solar yeah. power. I, I mean, I think it's all great in theory. It's very expensive. And, uh, it, you know, interesting to see whether consumers are prepared to pay the price. If you really went to a model where all the, bat the battery charge was from solar and millions of battery you know, places, you'd have a hell of a lot of um, capital investment and not very much energy efficiency. So yeah, I think all of these things are sort of interesting. But, but it is back to you know, the theme of what I talked about was let, let's be realistic about what is possible today and let's do the things that we know can make a big difference with the technology we know can work today. And over time, some of these things that people are working on will probably f we'll find a way of taking them to scale. But, but they're not scalable today. Thanks, Professor. I, I'd like to go back to policy a bit. Um, so I, I, I enjoyed the talk and thought you mentioned a couple times, and there seems to be a, a bit of consensus within the audience and yourself, that policy is ultimately the bottleneck, but also the enabler for a lot of this stuff technology and the energy initiative. So I guess my question to you is, given the historical differences or difficulty over the last 20 years in multi-nations coming together to form a consensus on some of these tough energy problems and coming with different um, agendas, what would be your advice in December as the world leaders meet to discuss the energy initiatives in the context of what you just recommended? Well, I'll, I'll answer that and I'll, I'll also give you another, another view. Um, I, you know, I think Copenhagen, it will be declared a success. Everyone should be clear about that. Um, uh, and all of us will say, well, was it really? But, but I do think that it, 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 we shouldn't um, discount the amount of alignment that has been achieved in the world over the last two years. If you go back two years ago, the US was going that way, China was going that way, Europe was sort of going that way, and you know, India was probably going that way. Um, there's a lot of alignment now in the world, and I think uh, Copenhagen is about sort of ratifying that the direction that the world wishes to travel in is that direction. The, the remaining debate is simply about the velocity of travel, not about the direction in which we wish to go. And, uh, you know, if Co Copenhagen can ratify the direction of travel, which I believe it will, then we should all think that's a good outcome. Uh, and there will be, you know, further debates about the velocity of travel in the future. Uh, I think, you know, the reality is if you boil all this down, this is about only two countries. It's about what this country is going to do and it's what, what China is going to do. Uh, and nothing, you know, it's, it's ridiculous to say nothing else matters. But if the so-called G2 could create alignment about how they were going to deal with this issue, then everyone else would fall into line. Uh, and that is, of course, why 
there is so much going on between the US and China in this space. You know, there are very high level meetings pretty well every week. And it is a very intractable problem for both countries for different reasons. But it, you know, I'm, I, I'm, I have to say I'm more optimistic than pessimistic. Yeah, well, hey, we're Europeans, you know. We're sort of, but, you know, we've been there for a long time, Ernie. We're just not very good at ex execution. Um, hi, Tony. A couple hi. more questions going back to this interesting uh, topic you mentioned, the shale gas in North America. Uh, firstly, uh, in the short term, how is this going to affect the Russian gas industry, and particularly in the light of its hegemony in Europe uh, in recent years? And secondly, uh, in the longer term, what sort of carbon price do you think we need to be looking at in terms of... Uh, of mitigating the risk of uh, large-scale investment in renewables and, say, a uh, nuclear project that's going to last 60 to 80 years? Um, well, I think uh, Russian gas, of course, has been impacted much more by uh, the recession than uh, the advent of shale gas in, uh, in the US. You know, if you look at Russian exports, gas exports to Europe this year, they're down 50% which is a reflection of the dramatic industrial downturn in Europe and the fall off of um, demand, combined with a lot of new supply coming on stream from other places. I, I, what I would say is I do think that the US can look forward to um, being completely dependent on indigenous resources. I don't think it needs to look to importing LNG to satisfy its needs which was not the view that was held four or five years ago. You know, it turns out we've got, built some LNG terminals, which is quite handy because you know, they can sort of come in w when necessary uh, and probably will always come because it's the, you know, it's the market of last resort because of the storage that exists in the US. But I don't, you know, I think if you asked, I don't suppose they'd ever acknowledge this, but if you talk to the State Department five years ago, they were very focused on how they could deal with Russia, recognizing that Russia probably needed to become a very significant supplier of gas to the US. And there was a lot of debate going on at that level. Today, they have the luxury of saying they probably don't need to worry about that. It's not true in Europe, but it's certainly true for the US. So I, th I mean, it's interesting how these things impact all sorts of dimensions, not only energy and climate, but foreign policy, et cetera. Um, what was your, I forgot what your other question was. Oh, carbon price, yeah. Well, um, I, I think, you know, the, the sort of prices that people are talking about are, let's say, 20 to $40 a tonne. That's going to be sufficient to make some big changes. So, you know, I, the sort of range that people are talking about is fine. It, it probably won't be sufficient to make things like carbon capture and sequestration move, but it'll be very helpful for wind. It'll be very helpful in the coal versus gas debate. So there's lots of things that would happen if that was in place. Thanks. Hello, Tony. Uh, <coughs> you've been a little bit down on the potential of solar for uh, mitigating greenhouse gas emissions, but then solar just means it comes from the sun. And uh, in fact, there is a kind of solar out there that probably has the potential to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by somewhere between 10 and 20 percent, uh, maybe even in just the next decade if it was really deployed at scale, because it certainly works. It's been around for a long time. And that is flat plate uh, solar panels for hot water. You can also do refrigeration for buildings via absorption refrigeration. And uh, it can pro pro provide process heating uh, for large industrial users. And uh, we had a very nice talk from a fellow named Christian Holter who runs an Austrian company called Solid that just put a 10,000 square foot array on one of the MIT's dorms uh, here and uh, they have a nice power purchase agreement with MIT to pay for it without any capital cost to MIT. Uh, I'm wondering if the reason you left it out was because you're including this sort of thing in energy efficiency or uh, where, wh wh why didn't you mention well, it? Well, I, I mean, I didn't because I guess I didn't mention everything. I mean, I agree with you. I think um, solar thermal is, um, is something that can, in some places, works particularly well today. I mean, I, I have a house in Spain. We've got solar thermal on it. We use it to heat the, heat the water. It works fine. You know, there are a whole raft of other things you have to take care of, of course, you know, because it's intermittent. So, you know, you need, you need to have backup during the night and all the other things. But in terms of 
You know, there's an opportunity in this country for sure. It, it, it won't change the game on its own, but it's, a, you know, it's back to this. Uh, you know, I, I have an expression that is, you know, it's all of the above. You know, we, we're in a place where, it, you know, we need everything. So where it works and makes sense, we should be doing that. Um, I, I, you know, honestly, in the U.S., I'm not sure. I, I've never understood why it hasn't taken, you know, we hadn't seen in the U.S. what has occurred in Southern Europe, for example, or in part of, you know, India, Brazil. I mean, there's lots of places where, you know, <laughs> heating up some water from the sun is a perfectly sensible thing to do. And, I, I, you know, I don't know what the reason is here. Maybe you can, someone here can, you know, what do you, why, why hasn't it taken off in this country, Anne? <laughs> I'm sorry? The politics of the American versions of BP, meaning the companies here. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think so. I, don't, I mean, I don't actually, you know, because it's not, it's not really, a, you know, we're not, not really competitive, actually. I mean, it's not, you know. What, are, what would be your policy goals to align the United States and China? And by what means? Poor. What a good question. <laughs> uh, no, um, let me see if I can, keep, I'm see if I can find a short answer. So I, I would say um, a carbon price, a uh, open energy markets between the two countries, and a technology transfer accord or something that allows the free flow of technology. Uh, and, you know, frankly, unless that happens, then China is not going to be able to deal with its challenge. So, you know, I mean, I, off the top of my head, I would say those three things. If those three things are in place, you'd actually, um, there'd be an opportunity to make real progress. Yeah, no, go on, yeah. Go on, go on, you're going to tell me. I, I thought you were going to give me a better answer, Ernie. Given that we will all feel good about this alignment, what about getting to an actual enforceable deal? Well, I mean, industry is, um, <laughs> is very active, but of course, you know, industry unfortunately isn't terribly aligned. And, uh, and, you know, one of the things that um, I, I guess I've come to realize personally is that if we take cap and trade as a, as a great example, you know, cap and trade is undoubtedly the intellectually pure way of dealing with the issue of carbon because it sets a, a cap, the cap reduces over time, and the trading mechanism allows you to allocate resources to the most efficient way to reduce carbon. It's intellectually pure, it's the right thing to do. What we've demonstrated really in spades in this country is that the political process, uh, it's very difficult to take the intellectual theory and get it into a workable solution because of the lobbying on the part of all sorts of people, but, you know, primarily industry participants. So I think, you know, I, I, I don't want to sort of cop out, but you know, we can't even create alignment in the oil and gas industry about our position with this. You know, BP is out here and others of our competitors are in a rather different place. Some of them, until very recently, have been complete denial that there's an issue. So I don't think that it's credible to say, well, we can just look to industry to solve this. I mean, I do think this is, you have to go a bit higher. You have to be able to trust the people that we've elected into office to represent all of our interests, not special interests and you know if there's one thing that's been disappointing over the last uh, six or nine months in this country has been that we haven't managed to have the politicians get above vested interests actually and the, you know the consequence of that uh, we see we've seen in what came out of the house